the the title can be put up where, where, when i am introducing you that also is fine okay okay, okay. so we are live now and we'll be starting in 4 minutes time it's 6:26 now we'll start at 6:30 so we have Perfect. few minutes yeah we'll wait for the no others problem. to join thank you yeah Yes, it's coming. It's correctly uh, being screened. Okay. Yes, no issues. It's it's okay. Okay. I can leave it like that. Uh, we can uh, keep it on. I mean, you can stop screen sharing for a few minutes, and then once we start, Fine. we can. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. This is good. Hello, Caroline. How are you? Good. How are you? Fine, thank, thank you. Thank you for yesterday. It was very good. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Is Anna Maria joining? No, no. Today, no. no. <laughs> okay. All right. I will update them. Oh, sure, sure. Happy feast. Anyway, this is uh, you will have it on the Facebook page, so you can access it there as well in case. Ah, very good. He needs to go over it. Yeah. Very good. So we are already live. We'll be starting in just two minutes. Uh, once it's six thirty, we'll start. Okay. People are joining in today. It's been a holiday, so I mean, every day is otherwise. But <laughs> yes, yes. So, Doctor Itobe, you finished with your touring. You were touring some place in between, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, now I'm in, I'm in Argentina. Yeah. Uh, still, I will for some time more. Then I will go back to India. Okay. So when are you coming next month, September? Hopefully, yes. Depends also on the availability of flights. And at this moment, it's a little bit irregular. No, there are no right. regular flights. Okay. That's the main difficulty. That's true. Okay, so no. are we good to go? All right. Ah, namo namo, ma'am. Namo namo. Doctor Kalacharya has joined. Hello, ah. Kala. Hello. Hello, Kalacharya. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hello, Doctor Iturbe is there. Hello. Yes, yes. Hello, Doctor Kalacharya. Hello. Hello. After Hello. a long time, Mariana Iturbe. Yes, after a long time. <laughs> Fine, How are you? Very well. Very well. Very well. <laughs> okay are we ready to start can we begin with 6:30 and we have having most of a lot of people joining us so good time to start namo namaha everybody and on this side of the world those who are in india good evening those on the other side of the world good day to all of you uh first at the outset let me wish all of us uh, a very very happy independence day and i'm sure this day will also be the beginning of independence of thought where we are able to think with more clarity and independently so i wish everyone a great day although the day is coming to an end i'm sure we carry this fervor in our mind forever so welcome to the sanskritotsav of uh, sanskruti samvardhan and samshodhan pratishthan once again i'm very happy to invite uh, to welcome our speaker dr mariano iturbe who is uh, currently in argentina uh, at the same time i take this opportunity to welcome the president 
of SSASP Shri Dilip Karambekar ji, the Executive President Dr. Kala Acharya, uh, the Coordinator Dr. Vikas Gokhale, some of our eminent speakers who have been joining us every day and today is no exception, Dr. Kanchan Mande, Dr. Lalita Namzoshi, uh, uh, Caroline too has joined us uh, very happily, this is, uh, she's continuing to join us every day and uh, I'm happy to welcome all the others who are participating and also those who are watching us live on YouTube and on Facebook. So welcome once again. With no ado, let me take uh, this opportunity to introduce to you Dr. Mariano Iturbe. Dr. Mariano Iturbe, for those of us uh, who are familiar with uh, most of Western philosophy would know uh, him. He's done his MA in philosophy from the university, that is the Universidad Nacional de Cordoba, that is uh, Argentina and also the University of uh, Spain. He has completed his MPhil and PhD from Delhi University under the guidance of Professor S.R. Bhatt on the topic Human Action in Ramanuja and Thomas Aquina. He's been affiliated to the University of Navarra as a researcher and also to the other university in Rome. And he goes as a lecturer and uh, he's been a visiting scholar at the Center of Philosophy School of Social Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University. At present, he is the adjunct professor of philosophy, K.J. Somaya, Bharatiya Samskriti Peetham. And he's also the delegate for India of the Office of Admissions of the University of Navarra. He has to his credit several publications, amongst which there is joint work between K.J. Somaya, Bharatiya Samskriti Peetham, as well as the Pontifical Urbanania, a university in Rome. Its title being the Hindu Christian Dictionary. And uh, this is essential terms for the interreligious dialogue. He has contributed with several articles and other books published, mm -hmm. even a book with paper published by Aryan Books, International New Delhi. So I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Mariano Iturbe and uh, over to you, sir, who will be speaking on Greece as the cradle of Western thought. Mm -hmm. I'm sure as much as Indian philosophy intrigues and interests all of us, we'll be very happy to learn more about the Western philosophy and add to what we know through Dr. Mariano Iturbe's talk. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Ruchita Rane. Thank you very much for this introduction. I greet also Dr. Kalacharya, director of the Institute, who I know for so many years. And to all of you, of course, I, I also joined the, the greetings for the Independence Day of India today, 15 of August. And we have one hour, no, for the, the time for the presentation. We have 45 minutes with a few minutes for questions. Uh, oh, so that we fine. Perfect. Perfect. So I will share with you also a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, I, okay. So <laughs> Greece as the cradle of Western of Western thought from me to Logos, that is the topic. So we'll be like a within this course in which you are uh, discussing different topics of Indian philosophy, this talk comes from a different uh, point of view, that is also the approach to truth, the look, the search for truth, the search for wisdom that uh, was done, uh, done in the West, especially the origins in Greece. And well, uh, there was the famous city of Delphi in Greece, where, where we have seen the, the ruins of the temple of Apollo. And in, in one of the windows, uh, there were three famous inscriptions in this uh, temple. One of them was know yourself or know thyself, no? not in Seuton in Greek. So was to know yourself. That somehow is what we can say, what summarizes the history of philosophy in the West and in the East, is to know ourselves, to know the Supreme Being, to know what the world and our wow. relation is there. Human being is characterized for that, is a being that aims at knowing himself, aims at knowing herself. And we know that in India, the technical, term used to express the nature of philosophy is darshana, and 
Darshana means that direct, immediate, intuitive vision of reality, but not only to look into reality, but also to, to get to know the means leading to that realization. So it's theoretical and practical at the same time. And when we read history of thought, is um, history of civilizations, it is quite impressive that more or less around the 6th, 7th, 5th century uh, BC, in different parts of the world, we have a, an effort to get, give an answer to those fundamental questions of humanity. We, we have a, a Vedas, Avesta, Confucius, Lao Tse, Tirthankaras, Buddha, Homer, Euripides, Sophocles, Plato, Aristotle, all of them more or less around the same time seeking an answer to these fundamental philosophical questions. Where have I come from? Where am I going? Who am I? Why is there evil? What is there after this life? These questions, in one way or another, have been posed by different uh, those genius of humanity and tried to give an answer. And this signifies that there are several means to generate knowledge. One of them, uh, we can have writings related religions, writings related to novels, epics, drama, and also we have what is philosophical writing. That is what we will focus more mainly today. Um, philosophy that etymologically means love for wisdom, eh? philo, love, stopping wisdom, is one of the noblest human tasks. Is uh, one of, <laughs> is to search for those for an answer to those main questions of life meaning. Uh, and it's an expression of that desire that every human being has, that is to know, moved by wonder. When we get that wonder in front of creation, in front of nature, in front of whatever we share, well, that is an effort. In, in fact, every human being is a philosopher, but when we speak about the history of philosophy, we talk about philosophy done in a more systematic way. So it's one of the noblest human tasks and is a continuation of our innate search for truth and is an answer to the wonder at creation, the wonder at the, 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 the marvelous things that are in this world. Now, of course, not everything is philosophy. That is why philosophy is a particular branch of knowledge, very specialized. Philosophy uh, is a rigorous mode of thought that produces a systematic uh, body of knowledge. And here in this slide, you can see philosophy leads to speculation, but not just a kind of a vague speculation. It will follow a rigorous process of thought following the rules of logic, we can say. That is why in all philosophical system, even if sometimes the, the opinions or the, the, the statements were different, would be different, but there is on the one hand coherence, on the other hand, unity. Always there is a unity that gives life to the entire system. And, and that is why a school of philosophy or a philosopher produces a systematic body of knowledge. And there is a common implicit philosophy, you know, like the principles, metaphysical truth, moral values, the principle of that finality, of causality. Uh, these are uh, uh, the implicit philosophy that is present in every philosophical school. So we can say that philosophy has a, a, sorry, a, has a, a double, a double, um, Purple, no? It's a way to come to know about the fundamental truth of human life. And it's also an indispensable help for a different understanding of religious knowledge. Philosophy and religion, so philosophy and theology should go together also. Uh, in, in fact, philosophy means uh, to reject this danger, that is the pessimism about the power of my reason. Pessimism of the, about the power of my reason leads to a skeptic, skeptical outlook, means I doubt that I can reach what truth is, or relativism, that truth is absolutely 
linked to my own opinions, my own feelings. Therefore, it's difficult to reach a common truth or agnosticism. The truth is like veil hidden for ordinary citizens. Well, if we fall in any of these three uh, attitudes, logically, we will be unable to do philosophy because we will be thinking that it's impossible to know the truth. And philosophy, perhaps, instead of looking into what being is, in what reality is, will end discussing only on the possibilities of human knowledge, whether I can know the truth or not. And then we can not, <laughs> we lose the richness of what is true philosophy. Here, I want to read a quotation that I find it quite uh, uh, enlightening. Pope uh, John Paul II, who not only was a religious leader, but he was a philosopher. And he wrote a document about faith and reason, Fides et Ratio, and he spoke about this danger. I quote, many people stumble through life without knowing where they are going, with its enduring appeal to the search for truth Philosophy has the great responsibility of forming thought and culture. Now it must strive resolutely to recover its original vocation. So philosophy exists because human being has that capacity. Okay? It's capable of reaching the truth about ourselves, about others, and, our, and about the supreme being. Uh, now, this introduction was a little bit to clarify what philosophy is all about, what is the nature of philosophy, what is the aim of philosophy. Now, we, the next point will be why do we talk of Western philosophy or Eastern philosophy? Why do we say that Western philosophy start, started uh, in Greece? So let's look, let's focus now into Greece, into this country and this civilization, because when we speak about this Greek civilization that happened centuries ago, we are talking not only of the geographical country of Greece, but the entire surrounding area that were influenced and dominated by Greek culture. Uh, so the Greek civilization, because Greece was the right pl place for the beginnings of the philosophical activities in the Western world. So that we will try to analyze why Greece what we can say the chosen place for philosophy in the West to begin. And we go thousands of years ago, we'll go to the Aegean civilization. So the Aegean civilization first has a very ancient period of thousands of years. We can call it the Stone Age, which was like the prolegons. And of course, we don't have anything uh, written or uh, but there, of course, is already sort of civilization. And then it was followed by the Bronze Age. And somehow towards the end of the Bronze Age is when classical Greek civilization started. So the Stone Age, Bronze Age prepared the future ancient Greek civilization. Within the Bronze Age, and I will not enter into details because that is out of the scope of this talk, but just in order to help us to understand more, we have several civilizations. But the Cycladic civilizations, I go uh, a little bit back to the map. So here you see in the map the Aegean Sea in the middle between Turkey, that at that time was Asia Minor, Anatolia, and on the left uh, we have Greece. Uh, so, and all these islands that are on the Aegean Sea are what we call the uh, cy uh, Cycladic Islands and where the Cycladic Civilization evolved from 3,200 years uh, BC onwards. After that, in the island of Crete, at the south, you see the, the big island of Crete, uh, we have the Minoan Civilization. And that also was very important. In fact, Crete developed a civilization that was unknown to the rest of Europe. So in the island of Crete, a, a civilization evolved with a lot of art, sculptures, um, and different uh, 
<laughs> cultural problems that were absolutely unknown in the rest of, uh, of any European region. Then after the Minoan uh, civilization, we have the Mycenaean civilization and on the main line on the, of Greece. And then after the Mycenaean civilization, we will have the sort of a dark age and later on the Greek civilization. So it's interesting because uh, how the Aegean civilization was discovered. It was a historical discovery uh, in the Albino of the 20th century. In 1870, there was a, a German merchant whose name was Heinrich Schliemann, who wanted to prove the historicity of the Homeric poem, you know, the famous poems, the two epics that are the most traditional epics of the Western, the West are Iliad and Odyssey, the two written by Homer about the Trojan War, etc., etc. So myth and histories about it. And it was a fascinating, it is a fascinating epic, both of them, and that has fascinated human beings for thousands of years. And Henrik Schliemann traveled to the area of Troy, in what is now the Turkey, in Asia Minor, to try to uh, prove the historicity of the Homeric poem. So he began to the excavations on the site of Troy, but there he found remains of a far earlier culture. He didn't know. And for decade, decades, those uh, ruins, those uh, remains of a far earlier culture, no one knew the history of them. No one knew from where they were, why they were, were there. So we have to wait in the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, when um, Sir Arthur Evans made some excavations in Crete, and in Crete he found the answer to the, the search of Henry Schliemann. He discovered that in Crete there was an ancient civilization that we have forgotten, that he, and he, that he was given the name of the Minoan civilization. It was characterized because in Greek they were building uh, at that time the Minoan civilization, Greek uh, big um, palaces and big buildings, a lot of uh, art also in the tombs of the people, well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was the Minoan civilization. So after the Minoan civilization that ended, one of the things that contributed to the end of that civilization was the eruption of a volcano 100 kilometers north of Crete that practically well, destroyed everything around. And then different geographical uh, tragedies and also uh, other uh, political reasons. But just the Mycenaean civilization that evolved, so we go back to this slide, the Stone Age. So here it, it, the civilizations were in Crete, the Cyclade, Cyclade Islands, and on Greek mainline. And after the Minoan civilization, we have the Mycenaean civilization. That was the last phase of the Bronze Age, somehow the link. Even though between the Mycenaean civilization and Greek civilization, we have what is called the Dark Ages in the Greek civilization for two centuries from more or less 1200 BC to 900, uh, 900 uh, BC, we have a, a period in which there is very nothing written, so not written records, but and, and some there are some yes base base uh, and some paintings very much characterized by geometrical drawings, and that is what we call the dark. And after, at the end of that, uh, uh, and after the, the Dark Age, will come the Greek civilization. But just to show something, the only sculpture that remains standing from the Mycenaean civilization is the, the Lion's Gate at the city of Mycenae, uh, in the, what is Peloponnese now, that peninsula at the southwest of Greece, the Peloponnese, where we have this uh, gate, it was the main entrance to the city of Mycenae, and on top, 
cannot very well see, perhaps, but on top of, of, the, of the entrance, there are two lions standing and a sort of a pillar in the middle on top of an altar. Well, we, we don't have many details, but it's amazing because that is the only sculpture that remains from this period. So we are talking about something that has been there for uh, uh, more than 3,000 years, almost 4,000 years. Now, how the Mycenaean civilization disappeared is not yet known. It's a topic of a study. Before there was the idea of the Dorian's invasion. Nowadays, historians consider the Dorian invasion not to be historically true, so more like a sort of a mythical. So most probably uh, the, the Mycenaean civilization died because of their own internal problems. Uh, and there was little by little a slow decline and as I said, went into that period of transition that was the Greek Dark Ages. And then in the 9th century BC, or in the, especially in the 8th century BC, started the ancient Greek civilization that uh, will last till the year 146 before Christ, 146 BC, was the, when the Romans conquered Greece after the Battle of Corinth. And at the center of that Greek civilization, especially in the fifth and fourth century, we have the splendor of Greek philosophy, Greek drama, Greek poetry, Greek history, etc., etc. Really, the, the level of knowledge and the level of sciences and literature produced in Greece was uh, amazing uh, for everyone. Here you see another map of classical Greece already. Uh, and when we talk about uh, classical Greek civilization, we distinguish also different periods. <laughs> the first period is the archaic period within Greek civilization, 750 to so BC, so 8th century BC to the, to the end of the 6th century BC. There is when already they, the Greeks have an alphabet and they began to write in Greek. It's the beginning of Greek literature, and we have poets like Homer, as we said, author of Iliad and Odyssey, Hesiod, who wrote uh, about uh, also the cosmogonies, uh, book of words and days, and the origin of the gods. Then we have also the beginning of the polis. Polis, were, polis means city in Greek. So, the Greek civilization was characterized for having several city states, yeah, like Singapore, we can say city states, small, independent, that at the same time were related to other city states, but each one was like a small country in itself. And that gave a lot of splendor to Greece at that time. At the same time, it was also a source of conflicts and some wars were uh, 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 caused because of the problems between one police and the, and the other police. So, for instance, the first Greek war during this period was the Lelantine War, and it was a war between two polis, two city-states, the one of Chalcis and the one of Miletus. Uh, sorry, the one of, of Chalcis and the one of Eritrea. That, uh, on the Euboean island, an island close to the Aegean Sea. After the archaic period will come the classical period, that is the golden period of Greek civilization. There, the, the, the city that was dominating the scenario was Athens, and the Delian League was the Delian League was a, a league of several polis, of which Athens was the the most important one, and the main enemy of Athens uh, was Sparta, uh, and somehow the preeminence of one city or the other was changing according to the circumstance, uh, historical circumstances of the time. And the third period after the classical period is what we call the Hellenistic period, already in the from the fourth century BC till, till the moment in which in which Greece came under the power of the Roman Empire. And that is the Hellenistic period. Hellenistic comes from Hellas. Hellas is the name for Greece. Eh? Greece in, in 
uh, proper language is called Hellas, H-E-L-L-A-S. Eh? Uh, -E and from Hellas comes the Hellenistic period. So this is the moment when Greece was uh, uh, spread all over the, the Western world known at that time, thanks to the military campaigns of Alexander the Great, but he died in the year 323, he has defeated the Persian Empire, and that was the moment in which the Greek culture did not limit only to Greece, but spread all over the Western civilized world at that time. And the last moment was the Roman period, so that from the 146, not the last moment, but uh, from the 146 till the end of the Roman domination in the year 330, when they established of the Byzanti, Byzantium and the Christianization of Rome that uh, was done in the last, uh, from the fourth to the sixth century of this era. And usually, we use a symbolic uh, event to signify the end of, e of ancient Western philosophy, that is the year 100 to, uh, 529. In the year 529, the emperor closed officially the academy. The academy was like the famous uh, philosophical school founded by Plato several centuries earlier, and it was a uh, the place where all the ancient philosophers uh, taught, uh, most of them. So it was closed in the year 529, and that is what we consider the end of the ancient Western, ancient Western field of philosophy. Uh, well, among, I was saying that among the, the, the cities, uh, the, the relationship between the different polis, there was a lot of rivalry between Athens and Sparta. Sparta was character. Sparta has not left, bequeathed to us any book, any book on, on, on drama, any philosopher. No, Sparta, uh, Sparta was a military country. They defeated the Mycenaeans, who was one of the cities there. Most of the Mycenaeans who were kept captives were converted into slaves, and those slaves began to uh, perform. Uh, uh, different tasks within the Sparta uh, city. And um, Sparta is known by being a military country. Here we see that one of the uh, part of the military uniform with the helmet worn by them. Now in Athens, um, that was the mo most cultural city, the most important, in which most of the cultural events occur. The, perhaps the most emblematic symbol of ancient Athens is this, what you are looking at now, the Acropolis, the Parthenon. The Parthenon, that was the temple to the goddess Athe Athenas, and was all done by the marble, pantelic marble, and it was uh, 227 feet long, 101 feet wide, and 65 feet so it was an impressive monument. Here you have another ruin, but here you can, you can see more. Um, so this was happening in, in Athens, while Athens was uh, keeping the preeminence. Then later on, there was the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta. So eventually, Athens will lose the, the preeminence and the leadership, but okay. Now, this uh, just the Persian Empire as was the other enemy of the Greeks. The, all the inv invasions coming from what is nowadays Iran, etc. But all of them were defeated by Alexander the Great. So all this that you can see that was the Persian Empire later on was transformed into the Greek Empire and later on into the Roman Empire. It was changing from one leadership to another. Now, before getting directly into the philosophy of this period, let's look at the ancient Greek literature, what was produced in Greece at that time. Uh, the first, as I said, the first centuries, the, the, the 
the epics of Homer that I have already mentioned, Theogony and Works and Day by Hesiod, Aesop is known by moralizing fables, and then the classical period of Greek literature, where we will have drama, poetry, and philosophy. Uh, in, for instance, first of all, we have to say that most of the ancient Greek literature is lost, even though uh, we still we keep a lot of things, but most is, has been lost. And sometimes we have lost the originals, but we know because some other uh, philosopher or writer quoted previous writers uh, because they have access to the original books. But from the entire, so even though we keep a lot, but most of the literature was lost. Uh, for instance, uh, there are 35 extant tragedies written by Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, 11 extant comedies written by Aristophanes. Then we have the books of historians like Herodotus, who wrote on the, on the wars of between Greece and the Persi and Persian Empire. Thucydides, who is considered the father of scientific story, because Thucydides tried to do history uh, in which the cause and effect were mainly human. No? It was not just mythological uh, reasons or mythological uh, arguments, but rational arguments. That is why Thucydides is uh, considered the father of history. Xenophon, who was a contemporary of Socrates, was wrote also about uh, history. And then in rhetoric, we have Demosthenes, who was one of the most famous Greek orators. Now, we are now in a moment here, you see the theater of Dionysus in Athens, usually the place where performing honors of, of Dionysus. Um, and now we go into philosophy into the beginning, through a real beginning of philosophy. First of all, there's a quotation of Christopher Dawson on the age of the gods that says, it was on the coast and islands of Asia Minor that the Hellenistic civilization of classical time had its origins, gradually returning westward to European Greece with a revival of trade and economic prosperity in the seventh and eighth century BC. Let me, Go back to the map. Here, no? As you see, Greece is on the left, so on the west, then the Aegean Sea, then the coast on the on the on the east, on what is now the Turkey, on Asia Minor, it was called Ionia. And in that Ionia, there were several colonies, even though not Greece, but they were under Greek power. And they had been colonized by Greece. That is why Ionia was a very prosperous area. We have cities like Miletus, Samos, eh, and others. Eh, and there is where philosophy begins. So the first philosophers come pre pre precisely the first three philosophers, Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes, start, come from Miletus. Uh, uh, I think from, from Miletus, here you can see, and that was because Greece expanded towards the east and then from the east came back towards the west. So and I consider the history of philosophy, or why we say that philosophy began? Why do we say that philosophy began in the 6th, 7th century BC and not in the 10th, 12th, 15th century? Because philosophy represents that clear path from myth to logos, from a mythological explanation in which everything is explained through unknown supernatural forces to a rational explanation of cause and effect of the origin of the world of the world and of the big issues of, man, of mankind. So it is accepted that the birthplace of Greek philosophy was, let's say, the seaboard of Asia Minor. The earlier Greek philosophers were Ionians. 
And, and then from that, Ionian philosophers began the first question that was to search for the arche. The arche or arche was to find out the principle, the origin from which everything comes out. Um, the, we call these first philosophers. In fact, in Greek philosophy, we divide what we call pre-Socratic philosophers and Socrates and his followers. So pre-Socratic philosophers are all those who came before Socrates, of course, but they are also characterized first because they exercise this path from myth to logos, and also because they were seeking the material cost of the world and also how this material cost was evolved into the entire reality. Uh, so what is a myth? Well, a myth is a narrative on big questions. No, a myth they will tell me it's a sort of a cosmogony about the origin of the universe, a sort of cosmology, a, a sort of also studying about the origin of human being. But somehow in a myth, all the explanations are a sort of a mythological, supernatural explanations, not natural explanation, not rational explanations. Philosophy that will be instead the systematic inquiry on the big questions. We also said, uh, discussed this at the beginning and natural sciences in which we will uh, study reality through ex uh, in a systematic way through theoretical and experimental inquiry into nature. Um, we, our uh, main statement is that the Greeks are the uncontested original thinkers and scientists of, of Europe. Why? Because we see this evolution from myth to logos. Uh, in fact, there are, how these three go together, no? There, were, there are three, three theories. There is a, a Augusto Comte, the father of positivism from the 19th century. He spoke that there were like periods in the history of mankind. The, the, the mankind was a child, when the theology prevailed, or myth prevailed. Uh, mankind was an adolescent when philosophy pre prevailed, a sort of a naive understanding of essential truths. And philosophy was mature when science prevailed. That was the theory of Comte. There is another theor theor uh, theory, non-interactive parallelism, the idea of a two truth theory. I can discover something as true through philosophy. I can, and I can discover something as true, even if it is opposite to the previous one, through theology. How can I accept that? By maintaining that there will be two different truths according to the methodology of my study. And the third uh, attempt, or the third theory, is integrationism. Plato, Catholic intell intellectual traditions, St. Thomas Aquinas, etc., in which there are different approaches to truth. One could be reason, pure reason, philosophy, one could be faith uh, through revelation, other could be science. And all these should not be clashing among themselves, but should be working together towards the discovery of the full truth. So the Presocratic philosophers uh, were mainly philosophers of nature. Sometimes we distinguish between all those philosophers, between Socrates and Socrates and, and, the, and those who continue after him, in the, by specifying this, that they were looking into the beginning of nature, into the origin of nature, while Socrates shifted the interest of philosopher toward man, toward human being, toward ethical issues. This does not mean that the pre-Socratic philosophers never discussed ethics, but it means that their main point was the origin of nature. And here is what I said, the arche or ar arche, to be written with A-R-G-J-E or A-R-C-H-E. So the arche is the source of everything. They were, this is what the Presocratic were looking, which was the source of everything that exists, because the, uh, the, the Presocratic, as every philosopher is always mm, 
concerned with the topic of change. Things change, but at the same time remain the same. A human being could be a child, a, a youth, an old man or an old woman. So, but remains the same human being. So how is the relation between the few, the one, and, and, the, and the many? And uh, in this search, the pre-Socratic pre philosophers look into the material principle, could be water, could be air, together with an eff efficient principle. So that water, air, fire, etc., could be material, or at the same time, at the same time, goes together with an efficient sort of attractive or repelling force. So the combination of this material principle and the efficient principle will give way to the entire uh, uh, nature and to all the elements of nature. Uh, here we have the, th the first three philosophers, the Ionian philosophers. All of them are for Miletus, you see. Uh, seven, six century BC. Thales, Thales is the father of Western philosophy. He didn't write anything, um, but whatever we know comes from his, his followers. The, the main source of information about the Presocratics comes in the books of Aristotle. <coughs> in the books of Aristotle, is where we find the, the more reference of quotations of fragments uh, from these three. Uh, Milesian, as they are called, philosophers. But you see, Thales considered that the real real, eh, the first material element out of which everything came out, the arche, is water. Anaximander will call it apeiron. What does apeiron mean? Something indeterminate, something that, well, is unlimited, eh, eh, but is not, cannot be identified with any, any particular thing. And from, it, from, it, from that apeiron and, the, uh, and the determined will come everything. And Anaximenes uh, <laughs> found it in air. Uh, just a parenthesis, uh, we know what the uh, Presocratic philosophers have taught us, have uh, written or have said, through a collection of fragments that was collected by two persons, uh, Diels uh, and Kranz, who at uh, the beginning of the 20th century put all the fragments together uh, in their original language, Greek or Latin, and then translated into English and other languages. And there we can find first testimonies given by philosophers centuries later, then fragments that have been kept, uh, attributed to each one of the Socratic philosophers, and then any other literature that refers to them. So that is then our main source of information. And it's a growing, uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress because from time to time, some papyrus is discovered, some fragment is discovered, and enriches our knowledge, our understanding of the teachings of the Presocratic philosophers. Uh, after the Milesian philosopher, we have then Xenophanes and Heraclitus. Xenophanes uh, is also um, very interesting. He, um, he considers earth and water the beginning of, of everything that exists. And Heraclitus, who considered that everything was changing. For Heraclitus, was like uh, uh, everything was in change. That is why. He considers fire, no? You see fire changes color, changes size, but out of fire comes everything. So, and that we underline all those changes, we have the logos, the, the rational principle that gives explanation to, uh, to all those changes. So Heraclitus was known as the obscure because he wrote a book on nature and his phrases are <coughs> very enigmatic, very difficult to understand. One of the famous phrases attributed to him comes in one of the dialogues of Plato. Plato said uh, that Heraclitus compared existing things to the flow of a river. You could not step twice into the same river. No? When you step 
for first time in the river, if you are the next day you step again into the same river, is water has, has, has passed, it's a different water. So somehow to express that the nature of, of everything was change. But at the same time, that change was not an, a chaotic change, was dominated by, uh, by the logos. Um, in the case of Xenophanes, that uh, I mentioned briefly about earth and water, uh, he finds truth as something difficult to achieve. So in Xenophanes, we find the first roots of future skeptical attitudes. He underlines that um, the difficulty to, to achieve truth. At the same time, sometimes he can be considered as a sort of monotheistic thinker, <laughs> though this is not very clear, but truly, uh, Xenophanes rejects any anthropomorphic view of divine being. So that is why sometimes there was an understanding that he could have been a sort of monotheistic uh, thinker. Another very important pre-Socratic philosopher is Parmenides and his followers Zeno and Melissus. Parmenides from Elea. Elea was a colony in South Italy that also was under the dominion of the Greek civilization. And Parmenides will uh, focus on what we can understand, what type of objects we can understand. For Parmenides, sense perception deceives us. So that is why our perception of the world does not reflect how the world really is, because somehow we are deceived by our own senses. Instead, through our reason, through our uh, through a logical approach, we can know uh, the reality. And he argues that the perception of movement and change is an illusion, and everything that is, everything that has always been and will ever be, uh, is that that always remains is what we can know. So Parmenides somehow denies the existence of change. For him, change is a delusion of our own senses. He wrote a beautiful poem that is uh, still is extant, and is, uh, he narrates the journey of a young man, Kudos in Greek. And that young man is taken to meet a goddess, and that goddess promises that he will, uh, she will teach him all things. Uh, so in Parmenides, we, we see a clear distinction between being and becoming, between rational knowledge and perception. Uh, well, then we have Pythagoras. <coughs> it's interesting because Pythagoras, um, he was more than a philosopher, a sort of a religious leader. He founded a, a religious and political sect in South Italy where he fostered aristocracy. Not aristocracy based on wealth, but aristocracy based on human virtues, human qualities. And he will try to give a mathematical understanding of reality, even though it seems that the tendency to mathematics in philosophy was carried out more by his followers. In fact, the famous Pythagoras uh, uh, theorem that we all of, of us we studied in geometry in the school, it's not really clear that he was the author. So we, till for centuries, we have said the, the theorem by Pythagoras, but perhaps he was not the author. In any case, then you see on the right, uh, the painting is painted by Raphael about the Athens the School of Philosophy. And there is Pythagoras uh, writing, and a youth is showing to him uh, some drawings, some mathematical drawings. Mm. Then we have also this pluralist uh, philosopher, Empedocles, Anaxagoras. So they speak that there were not only one principle, like be water, air, apeiron, fire, etc., but Empedocles speaks of four elements, Anaxagoras of seeds, in Greek, homeomerias, like an enormous amount of elements, and Democritus talks about atoms, it's sort of a like the antecedents of the future atomics uh, uh, understanding of the world. So when we see about the knowledge that we have of the pre-Socratics, um, we see that, as I said, 
we don't have the books written by them. Some of them, like Thales or like Pythagoras, didn't write any book, but we have many fragments, things that they said, things that are attributed to them. So we can know, of course, this was the prolegomens, the beginnings of Western philosophy. So only when we reach Plato, Aristotle, and later on, the Stoics, the Epicureans, finally the Plotinus, etc., etc., is when we will have treatises, uh, all the branches of philosophy developed. These were the, the pioneers of philosophy. So still we don't have the different branches like uh, metaphysics or logic or, uh, or uh, philosophy of nature, etc., etc. But in their writings, even though there is a, um, a primacy given to the search for the for the source of everything that exists, in, we find um, we find a deep philosophy. But of course, sometimes they were writing in, uh, in poet uh, like poets. Sometimes later on, philosophy was began to be written in prose. Um, so it's important when we. Because sometimes we can read the fragments and we can look down upon them. We can say, well, but this is not very serious, not very profound. No, we have to realize that they were the first people trying to give rational answers to the problem of reality. And the common factor that is behind all of them was wonder. Okay? So they were moved by wonder. They were moved by that admiration for whatever was around them. And they were trying, uh, looking for thus those uh, rational explanations. Um, just in this, uh, with this I, can, I can finish with this uh, a slide that summarizes the most important aspect of the legacy of the pre-Socratic. No? First of all, the problem, the main problem that they were discussing was the relation between the one, that arche, the first principle of everything that exists, and the many, whatever exists around us today. Only they didn't find the solution. As you say, for Heraclitus, everything was movement, nothing was permanent. There was no one principle. For Parmenides, everything was one, and what was the many was just an illusion. So only with Plato, with Aristotle, this problem will be solved. They were cosmologists in the sense that they were interested with the origin of the cosmos, of the world, not so much with the, the problems of human being and political, ethical problems that, that will happen after Socrates. In Parmenides, we already see the discussion between the relationship between sense perception and reason. Sense perception is invalid, while reason is valid. And in them, we find the root of future philosophic tendencies. So the entire philosophy that will evolve through in the West will find finds their roots in the pre-Socratic philosophers. So that is why we say that they were the, uh, they constituted the first attain, attempt to attain rational and understanding of the world. So finally, I would like to say that uh, it could be really a promise, it's a truth, and I believe it, that the philosophy developed by the Greco-Roman world from the sixth century BC to the sixth century of this era, when we finish ancient philosophy with the closing of the, of the academy, academy by the emperor in the year 529, this period, almost one, one millennium, has laid the foundation for all subsequent Western philosophy. Hence, classical Greece is considered to be the seminal culture which provided the foundation of Western civilization. Uh, still, uh, we have to know more and we perhaps future discoveries in the, in the years to come will enlighten us more about secrets, we can say, or, or, or fix things that have happened, that have been taught by the pre-Socratic philosophers. And we are open to those uh, new interpretations of the, that new knowledge. But so far, whatever we know, uh, help us to affirm with certainty that yes, they are the first attempt to attain a rational understanding of the world. And with this, I complete my presentation. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy.
Thank so thank you, you Dr. Thank you, Dr. Mariano Iturbe, for uh, this enlightening uh, uh, aspects uh, that you have presented with respect to Greece as the cradle for Western thought from myth to logos. And uh, if there are any questions, we can uh, take them. In uh, we can take a couple of questions, and then we can request Dr. Kalacharya to conclude. So I'm sure the audience will have questions regarding the comparison with uh, the Indian front or the Indian philosophy, but we'll wait for some of them to put it up. Yes, about the, the relation between India and the West, uh, of course, it's an open question, uh, even not only with India, with other Eastern civilizations. Sometimes we find similarities, but it's regarding particularly in the, the Greek philosophers uh, of the ancient times, Socrates and then Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, etc., and India, some points you can see, well, there are similarities, but at the same time, there's no any scientific proof that they knew the diff they are different philosophy. We cannot know whether Aristotle knew uh, Indian philosophy. At least he has never referred to it. So that is why is uh, it is an open question. To that. Okay, so apparently there don't seem to be any questions. So may I request Dr. Kalacharya uh, to please uh, say a few words? Dr. Kalacharya. Uh, Atharva, please unmute, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am, hello. Okay, I think uh, she isn't coming on. One minute. Okay, this morning she was having, okay. Ma'am? Ma'am? Hello? Hello, ma'am? Yes. My memory response, my hotel. I think there is some uh, problem with the network. Ma'am is unable to come on live. So on behalf of uh, SSASP, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Mariano Iturbe for a wonderful uh, uh, presentation and uh, enlightening one giving us those aspects of uh, hello ruchita am i audible ah, ah, yes you are audible ah. uh, please carry on uh, doctor uh, doctor marian uturbe thank you very much for uh, for such an eloquent exp exposition of the uh, your theme greece as the cradle of western thought what i want to say is that you in the beginning you said that know yourself or thyself was one of the three famous inscriptions of the temple dedicated to apollo and uh, you may be knowing that even Lord Buddha 
uh, all the uh, all the endeavor of all the Upanishads was also about to know oneself. And Lord Buddha says how to know oneself. He says Atma Dipo Bhava. I am telling Sanskrit version and not the Pali. I am quoting. He says Atma Dipo Bhava. Be light, be a light unto thyself. And what, that is the same uh, which was said again by Krishna Murti and Osho. Then you said that uh, philosophy is love for wisdom, born out of the quest. How and why I am born? And Eastern philosophy also thinks about on the same line. Koham kutaha gataha kutra gantavyam. But the main difference is that it is not only it. Indian philosophy does not stop by kutra gantavyam. Where to go? Or where from where I have uh, come? It goes beyond that, and there is a realization. of the ultimate truth and unless that realization is not there one cannot say that the aim of the philosophical search is over then you said that faith and reason are two wings on which man tries to contemplate uh, to contemplate of uh, on truth but where as here there is once again difference between the western and indian philosophy because kathopanishad says naisha tarkena mati rapaniya that the ultimate truth cannot be known by only reason reason is not the ultimate thing because these are the things the ultimate reality is something which goes beyond that and that's why even mahabharata says achintya khalu ye bhava na tan tarken yojayet do not apply logic in the matters which is inconceivable by oneself so tarko pratishtha is always said but it doesn't mean that reason is not applied reason is applied in the philosophical discipline for the search of the uh, ultimate truth but it is not the ultimate tool as such because we never bifurcate shraddha that is faith and uh, reason we we have not bifurcated them i don't want to say that and then you said that the a uh, western philosophy is always greek thought is clearly independent you said from religion in different areas whereas uh, indian philosophy is always it goes hand in hand with religion and we don't find any contradiction between the religion and the philosophical and the philosophy and both together uh, go on the pilgrimage of searching the ultimate so thank you very much for your very enlightening speech and i hope we are getting much more from you in your future speeches thank you very much as well kind of karacharya thank you for your concluding remarks very enlightening what you have said and and yes in the in the west of course uh, this relation between faith and reason also was present mm, here in among the presocratics among the greeks we see that is why i i mentioned the path from myth to logos that the these thinkers try to uh, remove anything that was mythological explanation not so much theology but mythological explanation instead uh, and that rational approach will be also characterized in aristotle etc in plato we find more a religious uh, a, a sort of double approach religious or theological and philosophical and of course I will find that only in the medieval ages, especially with Saint Augustine and with Thomas Aquinas, is when we find the perfect uh, uh, intermingling no, between faith and reason, uh, between faith and revelation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalacharya, ma'am, and thank you, Dr. Mariana Iturbe, for this uh, session. And uh, I'm sure we'll be looking for more. and i hope that you'll be joining us for the remaining sessions which are to happen so let me before we conclude for and stop for the day let me uh, announce to all of us that tomorrow we will be having our session like we always have it at 11 am in the morning and we have with us um, dr tomorrow we have with us dr r g murli krishnan who is professor in education he is the deputy director uh, and the cpio of central uh, sanskrit university and the in charge of schemes with regards to scholarships and ashtadashi so he'll be speaking tomorrow on sanskrita bhasha yaha vaibhavam vidyan vidyanancha so that is on the splendor of sanskrit language and science so i'm sure this is an interesting topic and uh, everyone would be 
uh, everyone present here will continue to be here tomorrow. So uh, on behalf of SSASP, let me take this opportunity to thank our speaker. Along with that, let me take this uh, opportunity also to thank the president, Sri Dilip Karambarkarji, uh, the executive president, Dr. Kala Acharya, some of the eminent speakers who are present with us, uh, Professor Nilima Kadhe, uh, Dr. Kanchan Mande, uh, Dr. Uh, Shri Ramagashe, Dr. Lalita Namzoshi, uh, and uh, I hope I have not missed any of the other speakers who've been present, uh, Dr. Ranjana Naigaukar. And in addition to that, all the eminent uh, personalities and people who have been joining us regularly, and also our coordinator, Dr. Vikas Gokhale. Thank you to everyone present here on the Zoom, as well as those who are listening to us regularly and even today on Facebook and YouTube. The sessions will be available if we all want to go over it again and again. They are present on our Facebook page. You may also visit our website, www.ssasp.in to know more about us. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, looking forward to seeing you all again tomorrow morning. Danyavadaha, namo namaha. Thanks to also our uh, uh, team who's supporting us, uh, Atharva from uh, Vivek Saptahik, our media partners, uh, Hindi Vivek, Mahatarun Bharat, and uh, also News Bharti. In addition to that, we've been, uh, our sessions are being relayed by Sri Aurobindo Society as well. So thank you to everyone. See you again tomorrow. Danyavadaha. <laughs>